Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Boss Talk, a new series featuring candid career conversations with people I admire and trust to keep it real. Today, we're going to talk about an issue that's incredibly timely and maybe even a little uncomfortable for some, and that's the experience of Black leaders in corporate America. It seems like not that long ago when this conversation would have been taboo or simply just not talked about at work. But today, and especially in light of current events and conversations around equality and justice, they're not only present in the workplace, but they're urgent, they're necessary, and in many ways, they are long overdue. And that's what I've invited our guests to talk about today. I am so excited to welcome two unstoppable forces, Salesforce's Chief of Safety and Security, Keith White, and Salesforce's EVP and GM of Health and Life Sciences, DP Brightful. Keith and DP, welcome to Boss Talks. Thank you so much for joining us today. Ebony, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> so we are just going to jump right into the first question. And for that, I really want to set the stage for today's conversation by digging into your backgrounds just a little bit. The number one thing I get asked and the number one thing I try to be as open and transparent about is how I got here. So let's take it back to the young Keith and young DP and talk about the early days. Keith, let's start with you. You went to Chicago State University, which is an HBCU. Tell us about that experience and share just the importance of HBCUs. For those of you who don't know, these are the universities that Black Americans first, they were the first opportunity they had to go to uh, college and in many instances, the only opportunity and they produce nations, uh, nation leading doctors, lawyers, engineers and all types of professionals. So they have served uh, our history uh, in an extremely important way and they continue to do so uh, today. So I feel really honored to be a graduate of Chicago State University. And I learned um, in that environment in particular, the value of diversity and the value of all the different cultures um, that make us um, who we are. And I learned it extremely well um, by attending an HBCU. Thanks, Keith. DP, what about you? Can you share an early experience that was influential in shaping who you are today? First of all, I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm proud of my city, Charm City, Baltimore, you know, Charm City, uh, as it were. But, you know, might might not be the, you know, easiest of places to grow up. But I'm actually quite proud of uh, where I grew up. But what I tell people all the time is um, the impact of my mom and dad in that environment, I, I, I could not, I, I, if I talk to, keep talking about it too much, I'll, I'll get emotional because I, I was blessed with two parents that in an environment where quite, quite literally all hyperbole to the side, I have friends that didn't even live to see 18, like they didn't live to see 18, but you know, me and my brothers were able, were able to make it out. And, and, the, and the, the memory that I have that I would share with you, Ebony and Keith is one day, I think I was second, third grade, somewhere around there. I came home. I, I, I got a B on a test, and I was so proud. Um, and I said, hey, mom, look, you know, I got, I got a B on the test. My mom looked at me and said, oh, son, I'm so, I'm so proud of you. You got a B on the test. And she stopped me, and she looked at me, and she said, but you do realize you can get A's, right? And, 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 and it, just, it struck me as she said that, and the confidence that my mom and dad put inside of me to say, son, you can be whoever you bleeping want to be. Um, and I just believed them. I, I just believed them. And so when I think about that shaping force in my life, having two parents that not only loved me, but put a belief inside of me that I could achieve uh, more is, is probably the strongest thing that I think shaped that would really become kind of foundational for me. That's great. Now, prior to Salesforce, you both spent over 20 years working for other big companies. Keith, you just mentioned retail, you were at The Gap, DP, you were at Microsoft. I know there are a lot of people listening who are thinking about making changes in their careers. So can you talk to us about your decision to take a risk and transition to something new? Yeah, you know, um, I, I always say that every single day, every year, every week, you have to reinvent yourself. Um, in order to bring value to what you do, or the organization that you do, you just can't stay and be in the same place. And every time um, I had a point of improvement or, or a point of uh, major uh, turn, it was because I 
was able to start with the beginner's mindset and say, you know what, I know I've accomplished this, but how much more could I accomplish? Just like DP said about his parents, B's are okay, but you know you can get A's. And I felt like uh, this move into the technology realm um, was really something that was personally challenging me to take a risk um, that I, I thought uh, I could uh, actually obtain and uh, realize in a, in a very positive way. And, and as a result, it's, it's, it's worked out well. I'm going to feed off of what Keith said. Don't be afraid to place a bet on yourself. You know, sometimes you can get so caught up in your current employer and, you know, what's in front of you that you don't do what Keith said. You don't look to reinvent yourself and you don't look to challenge yourself or stretch yourself or you see some other opportunity. And then there's that little thing in your mind that says, well, I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready. I don't know if I could. All of that. You know what? You got to kill that. Shut all of that stuff off when you know that you've done the homework, you've put in the time, you've had the experience, you don't do it foolishly, you let wisdom guide you. But when you know that you talk to the, those voices in your life, those mentors and those people that you trust, your personal board of directors, if you will, that you allow to speak into your life and, and they will guide you and you know that you're ready, do not let fear hold you back. Be willing to, t to place a calculated, take a calculated risk and place a bet on yourself. So we've often talked about the the 2% issue in tech, really the fact that black workers make up only two to 6% of the workforce at prominent tech companies. So, you know, we know that some try to point to a pipeline issue, which we know is an excuse given the incredible black talent all around us, including ourselves. So I wanna hear from you. Why do you think there are so few black people and people of color in our industry? I think what happens, Ebony and Keith, is a lot of times when our people hear tech, they instantly think computer science or engineer. And that if, and, and well, I'm not interested in, you know, I'm not a geek, right? So I don't, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to go become a computer scientist. I think um, what's missed a lot of times is all of the other disciplines um, that exist within a, the world of business and certainly the, and therefore the world of technology. If you look at STEM and, and anybody that's out there, if you're interested in any of those disciplines, God bless you, go for it, uh, my brother and my sister. So please do that. But understand that there are opportunities in technology that's outside of, of just of, of STEM. You can be a lawyer and still be in tech. You can be a salesperson like me and still be in tech. You can, all the finance, accounting, all of those things are needed in tech. There are so many disciplines and, and so many opportunities inside of tech. And I think we got to broaden our view of what, what it means to be part of a tech company. You, you know, Ebony, I'm going to take a little bit of a different tack. Um, I, here I am in San Francisco, and you know very well that you cannot get to the city, uh, get into the city without being on a bridge. And I think the tech world has operated on an island for years and they have not been held accountable. They haven't built bridges um, out to our community. Um, and it's not about the pipeline, it's about bridges. It's about granting access um, so that people know that they belong um, and that they follow whatever path they choose, including the one DP um, just outlined. And I think as a result, um, people have stayed away from the island and they have allowed uh, tech to operate uh, on its own. And I think it's high time uh, for uh, tech not only to build bridges, but for people like myself to cross them, to cross them, to go um, and show um, the value and the diversity that we bring to the business. And, and I said to a, a young group uh, yesterday that I was mentoring, um, I bring my entire self to work. I don't just bring part of me. And as a result, I'm able to transform everything that I'm involved in. And I amaze people by doing it. And I think the tech world um, would benefit uh, from the bridges um, that they have yet to build. Um, they're not completed. I love that concept of the bridge building. And, and I love that you just talked about mentoring because I know that both of you are so passionate about mentoring and the idea of lifting as you climb, which is something we've talked to a bit about here on Boss Talks. DP, you and I have talked about this at length, and I know you are very intentional with your teams about how to bring more people of color 
into your teams and building that next gen sales team that are that's diverse and more inclusive. Can you share more about your perspective on this? Right, coming from where I came from, being the ethnicity that I am, I feel like I have to go out. And when those opportunities are presented inside of Salesforce, I have to tap into my network. If I'm not tapping into my, not my network and bringing forth talent, um, it's pretty hard for me to point to other people and sit back and say, well, hey, what about you guys? I think you have to be a participant in your own rescue. And we have to make now to Keith's point, we got to hold everybody accountable. Don't get me wrong. I'm not. Yes. Yes. You're right. Because there are some s systemic things that need to be addressed. I'm not, uh, you know, amen to that. So I'm not dismissing that. But I do think that I, I feel a personal responsibility and accountability. Um, and yes, Ebony, I am, I'm very deeply committed to um, to that, not just in my organ, my piece of Salesforce, but Salesforce in large. That's great. And Keith, I know you've been a tremendous advocate for bringing in talent from non-traditional backgrounds and leveraging our internship programs through our partnerships with organizations like Year Up and, and others. Will you talk more about why this is so important? Well, first of all, um, I, I think that the traditional answer uh, to the question of how do we get more uh, uh, African Americans into uh, tech is let's go to college recruiting, um, let's check the pipeline, let's recruit or what have you, rather than doing things that are non-traditional, as you said, by working with groups that are focused on target you, um, who are just across that bridge that I talked about, sitting in cities like Oakland, and inserting them into the workforce immediately. And organizations like Year Up spend six months training these youth and then another six months, they intern them at great companies like Salesforce and other tech companies before they even have a college degree. And I think several years ago, that would have been unheard of. Who would, who would recruit someone in a technology company that hasn't graduated from MIT or some top uh, brand school? And what they're finding is that these young people um, in this target youth population coming into uh, their companies not only add value and perspective and diversity, but they are awesome um, and they help and they move the needle um, in the environment. And what I would say, um, being a little uh, contemporary here, is that they are the vaccine. They are the vaccine that we need. Uh, not only are we helping them and transforming their life, they're not just sitting there with their cell phone wondering you know, how do I click like or, or what have you? They actually are in the company um, that's developing these platforms that they use so often. And, and I think that's really the key is that we want to import these people now, not when it's convenient for us, not when they meet all of our criteria. We want them in our organization now. And what they don't know, we want to teach them. And, and I think that's the focus that I've participated in and it's really been beneficial. That's so great. I hope you all are getting this. This is so good. Thank you both. So we just mentioned that topics around racial equality and justice used to be taboo at work, but now they are absolutely front and center. Part of me is so excited about this. I mean, who would ever thought that we'd be having this conversation and that it'd be aired live? But I also know that a lot of people are struggling with these issues at work. Keith, talk to us about how you've personally navigated these issues and, and what advice would you give to people who are struggling with this at work? Oh, th this is really uh, uh, tough because, you know, the traditional approach before we were able to have this conversation would have been just tough it out. Um, you know, there isn't really any racism. It's all about uh, uh, you and, and your performance. Um, but what I want people to acknowledge is that there are challenges um, that are systemic. There are challenges um, that are out there. Um, but what's more important is how you manage yourself through them. Um, and I always say everything starts with uh, performance and really understanding what your responsibilities are and how do you perform. And, and for me, um, when I've encountered obstacles um, that I felt I, could, I had no control over, I was able to go over, around, or through them because of the value, ultimately, that I was able to bring to the role. That 
always uh, rescued me and, and allowed me um, to uh, persevere. And I would also say that uh, building a network of support, reaching out to people, and not just people who look like you, um, but people who are out there who care and who are invested in you and who want to sponsor uh, you from a career perspective, um, allows you to lean on them um, when you're in a system and you're reporting to a boss who may be blocking um, or not supporting you. Um, and, and that's ultimately, um, I think, what's helped me persevere in tough times, because there's also been great times when it was only about performance. And then there's been times when it was about other stuff um, and that my support system carried me through those those times. I love the, that building, that social capital, if you will. DP, what are some things that have worked for you? And, and maybe tell, tell your audience what you could, would recommend for them. All of us need somebody in our life um, that can check us down. And so because sometimes, you know, uh, sometimes it, it is it is the case that um, we're being held down for things that we can't control. And, and it absolutely is that. And then sometimes you need people inside of your life to sit back and say, whoa, whoa, whoa slow it down, slow it down. There are let's look at your performance. Are you really at, are you really as excellent in all of these areas as you as you think you are? Might you need to develop might some of the feedback that's coming to you? Are you lit? Are you at least listening to it critically and um, being self-aware um, so that so that you can progress? So as, 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 as I 1000 percent agree with everything Keith just said, having those supporters and give those supporters free license to be truly honest with you. You don't want just everybody that's going to be a fan. You know, oh, oh, man, you're great. You're wonderful. You're the best. You're the best. And everybody knows all of us. Let me lift my own hand. Um, have issues that we need to work on, right? And so I would say that, and then I would say that the other piece of the networking is um, at some point in time, if you know that you're in a bad environment, in a bad sit situation, having a broader network outside of just your company can allow you to make, maybe you need to make a switch, right? Maybe, maybe it is a time to make a change, right? And and that, that having that other network will give you that that platform to go in. And if you, you have to make that decision. You can make that you can make that change. So speaking of our networks, what advice do you all have for uh, both people of color and our allies tuning in right now on what they can do to make change within their organizations? Well, first of all, people typically see networks as vertical. You know, uh, you see a guy like DP, you see Ebony. I want to be connected in their network because I know they are powerful and they can help me. They need to start seeing networks as horizontal. People who you work with, people you know, people who are at your level or what have you, have an incredible network themselves. And they have a wealth of advice and support that they can give you and provide. And, and I think when they start to realize the full breadth and depth of the connectivity that they have, um, and they don't just cheat to people who that they think are powerful. Um, they will experience an unlock um, in terms of networking and developing uh, resources that they had been overlooking every day. Um, so I, I think that would be pretty key in that. I think right now we find ourselves at a moment in time where if we come together and we have smart, um, aligned, well thought through ideas, that we bring to the senior most leaders in our organization, I think we're at a moment in time where they will consider it. Um, and they are willing to make investments and willing to do things that prior to our dear brother George Floyd, they might not, not, might not have been as open to doing. And so I would encourage everybody, if you've got ideas, take the next step. Um, in formulating and working within your organization. And then here's the, the last thing I would say. Be unafraid, get some sponsorship behind you now to put that those ideas up high in the organization. I think that we can advance ourselves in ways that in years prior, I, I don't know that organizations would have been quite ready for. Well, it's clear to me that you both have so many superpowers, but I'm asking everyone what they think their superpower is. So Keith, I will put you on the hot seat first. Wow, um, I would say my superpower uh, for sure 
is emotional intelligence. And it was formed on the uh, hard streets of uh, the south side of Chicago, uh, where at an early age, um, before you got to the corner, um, you had to be extremely perceptive and know, you know what dangers uh, awaited you and what adjustments you had to make and whether or not in some cases you had to turn and go the other way. Um, and just your awareness level had to be super keen. It was a matter of personal safety. And as I transformed that skill set um, that I never really knew was valuable, except for on the south side of Chicago, um, it's extremely valuable in corporate America. Your ability to read situations, uh, read climates, uh, understand how you're coming off, know when to use the gas pedal and when to use the brake. Um, how many times have you been in presentations or situations where you're saying, oh, this is going bad. If I was you, I wouldn't say that right now. They're not ready to receive that. Yet the person plows on. Um, and it's so important for me um, to capitalize on that superpower because it, it just allows me to maneuver and move much quicker, much lighter, uh, much faster uh, to get things done when it's right to get them done. And then know when to, um, you know, set something aside that's just not going to gain um, the right amount of support. I love that, Keith. It sounds like you turned street smarts at an early age into that, that kind of flourished into high EQ and that emotional t intelligence that you're talking about. That's great. DP, what about you? Um, I'm kind of known for energy and inspiration. Vision, energy, inspiration. Um, I see the big picture. Um, I can see around corners and I can sign it. I can kind of see where things are going. And then for getting my tentacles inside of people's uh, hearts and heads and, and, and minds a little bit, I, I just, you know, I, I'd say it like this. I just genuinely, for real, I, I love people and I love getting a group of people together to go for something and to reach for something that they thought um, maybe they, they couldn't, uh, could a kid could somebody from the south side of Chicago, could a kid from Baltimore, from those backgrounds get there? Heck yeah, um, they, they, they can. And I love um, creating that vision with folks and inspiring people to achieve things that they didn't, might not have thought was possible. That is so great, DP. And I think we've all seen that in you. Wow. Keith and DP, your words of wisdom today were so helpful, so timely, so heartfelt and genuine. I cannot thank you enough for joining us on Boss Talks today and for being so honest and transparent about your experiences. I know you've got questions on this topic, so let's hear them. Hey, Marcus, I'm so glad you asked this question. I think of equality as our destination and equity as how we make sure that everyone can get there. It's about meeting people where they are and giving them what they need to be successful. And that really looks different for everyone. We talk about both at Salesforce and that's because we're focused on both. Really, they go hand in hand and I'd encourage any company focused on this work to take a similar approach. Thank you so much for sending us your questions. As a reminder, you can comment on our LinkedIn page or send me a tweet at Ebony Beckwith using hashtag Boss Talks. I really hope you all enjoy today's conversation. To continue building valuable skills for your career, head on over to Trailhead, Salesforce's free online learning platform that helps anyone skill up for in-demand jobs in the Salesforce ecosystem. With that, I'm Ebony Beckwith. Thank you for tuning in to Boss Talks.